You see this horrid mess behind me? I'm going to use this moment of the real world of detailing, at least my world, to illustrate a point about building value. Now, why do I want to drive that home? Because that's such a overly used term today. Build value, build value. Well, why do you want to build value? Well, so often I'm asked by you guys, endless guys riding in, people I consult with, hey Darren, I struggle with how to figure out my pricing. Hey Darren, I wanna make more. You know, the basic questions that, that essentially most of us wanna know. I wanna do something that I like to do, which is auto detailing and what you're looking behind me, most of you probably would say that has nothing to do with auto detailing. Well, at a casual observation, correct, it doesn't. But in my world, it does, because I've become very diverse. And that's where you have to figure out, because there literally is opportunity everywhere. But the goal is, essentially, to build a business, be your own man, not work for the man, uh, chart your course, course, build your destiny, all that stuff. And it comes down to this, this thing called building value. So you've got shopping price and you've got shopping value. If you go to my personal, or let's say my personal website, and I say personal because I have the two websites, autofetishdetail.com, bestautodetailing.com, bestautodetailingtips.com. So auto fetish detail, that's how I get business coming in to me, like this account or this job, this horrid, messy, filthy job. So if you go to my page, autofetishdetail.com, you will see how I talk to the people that are looking for detailing services. And I talk about the difference between shopping value and shopping price. I am not the guy that you want to go to if you're shopping price known as a price shopper or AKA a cheap ass. There is a saying, a quote, it has been quoted many times. The wealthy buy something once, the poor buy the same thing over and over and over again. Do you understand the difference of that? Because the wealthy, they understand what true value is and they know that you get essentially what you pay for. The poor, or the scarcity-minded individual, they look at the bottom number. That's all they look at. They don't look at anything else other than that bottom number. That is a price shopper. I do not want price shoppers. So I want value shoppers. But unless you have the ability to understand that basic tenet or principle of that is going to limit you if you don't even understand it yourself. So in understanding the difference of that, it's like, okay, value, value shopping, I need to find people that shop value. Well, what does that mean, Darren? Well, that means just that. What value do you bring to the equation? And I'm gonna use this moment to illustrate that, hopefully very specifically. So I do what's called decal removal. I have a page that's optimized for it. In fact, if you were to just go to Google right now and type in something like, let's say uh, decal removal Orange County. Now, if you're in an, another state, you need to put California in there because there is multiple Orange Counties throughout the continental USA. So try decal removal Orange County, California. How to remove decals from your RV. Uh, decal removal Orange County, California because I have many pages, because I do decal removal on company commercial vehicles, I do it on RVs, I do it on cars, you likely will find my website amongst the top of their search engine results. So, this moment, this customer, it's a what you consider a corporate account. This is a corporate uh, box truck, a company owned box truck. They want to get their decals replaced. What I'm using on this is my rapid remover to take off the adhesive once I have removed the top layer of the decal and you see it, it's starting to drip down because I'm allowing it what's called dwell time. So this is what I did in this moment is essentially, and this is why I've said in many of my videos, is 
you don't like the challenge of problem solving, detailing may not be the area for you. I think that really exists for any business owner because just like life itself, if you really want to create the life that you want, it will require you to figure out how to do that. You don't have to be great and all this stuff. You just got to know what to do. I know that, that, that that's reducing it down to the ridiculously simple, but it could be reduced down to that. So in this instant, or in trying to teach you guys how to develop value so that you can attract, oh, that noise, oh. Welcome to shooting on location. So that's what you've got to understand is how do you get inside or the position of the customer? How do you develop value for them? You've got to understand their needs, their wants, their, their pain points, their pressure points. If you can identify that through conversation, through communication skills, then you can start figuring out, okay, what does this person really want? And especially when it comes to corporate accounts, you have all these different layers because instructions or orders will come down from the top and they will flow downwards. So maybe you have a CEO, then you have a, a regional manager, then you've got a local manager, whatever. The point is, is you've got to figure out where, who really is going to suffer the consequences if the job is not executed properly. There's basic rules that you can always apply, which is A, we can reduce it down to one. Everyone wants to save money, especially at the corporate world, because everyone's always worried about the bottom line. So I already know that going into it. What I identify in this, and I've actually got a video that's in the process of being edited because I also talk about this specific, this specific account. Here I am on location actually working on it now, but there was a lot of conversations that happened before this. And that's what I want to illustrate to you is that this customer, because they're ignorant and they know they need to get a job done and they know they want to do it as cheaply as possible, those are the three key factors. They got to get it done, they got to get it cheap, done as cheaply as possible, and they're going to have to answer to somebody else. So I'm looking at her, which I'm on the phone with her in this instance, and the simple, because she's ignorant, that was the third point, sorry I kind of messed you up there. That was the third point is that I know she's ignorant. She really doesn't know what's involved with removing a decal on a truck that's like 15 years old. The decal's been there for like 15 years. It's horrid. Nobody wants to deal with this. So they contacted their sign shop and the sign shop said, very politely and being diplomatic, said, uh, you know what? Maybe you should seek out the help of a detailer that actually has experience in dealing with decals that are that old. Really, I'm certain they probably could have done it, but you talk to any sign shop, they don't want to deal with this stuff because it's, it just sucks. And most sign shops, just like most business owners, don't have the ability to communicate. And in this instance, what I mean is the ability to communicate and educate their customer so that, so that their customer has the ability to understand what they're up against. Because if a customer, and they will, they will oversimplify the equation and think, hey, what is, what's there to it? You just remove the decal. We just got to get it done. How much is it going to cost us? Just give me a price. That is where you've got to be able to take charge, rein them in, apply your expertise, and say, hey, here's the problems that we are up against. So the customer thinks that the simple answer is, hey, Darren, let's, or, let's pull me out of the equation. She thinks, hey, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna get some prices to get it removed and then get it replaced. And she had already done that. But then she, get me, then she gets me on the phone and I say, whoa, 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 whoa. Not necessarily, but I'm talking to you now, I'm not talking to her. And she very well could take the direction and the lead and I could follow her, but if I were to follow her lead, which I did at a level, 
and I gave her a price that was uh, shocking and astounding because she has no idea what it takes to remove something like this. But in doing that, what I did is I said, hey, let's pretend her name is Mary. Hey, Mary, I realize that's what you wanna do and that seems like the logical answer, but let's pull back for a moment and let's analyze this at a broader perspective. So how about if you did what I call a winning combination so that you get the results that you want and it's far less expensive than going the route that you think you want to go. Because the route you think you want to go, which is to remove this decal 100% and put a new decal in place, is going to be a insanely expensive. It just doesn't make sense. Why does it not make sense? Well, because the truck is old. They don't even use it that often. It's a basic box truck. She does not even know how much longer it's going to remain in service. So I'm listening to all this, and how is she telling me this? Because I take the time to ask questions, and I further take the time to listen. So, and anyhow, for all you people that get offended early or easily, don't get all butt hurt because, you know, occasionally I get these comments. It's like, wow, Darren, you're such a condescending prick. It's like, well, I'm just trying to illustrate the point and be very specific and precise in explaining that to you so you understand it, so you can actually walk away and implement it into your own world so that you can actually make more money than you're currently making. That's my goal. So I tell her that, you know what actually would make sense, and this is based on experience, and based on the year of the truck and the fact that you don't know if it's going to be in service for much longer or not, what if we did this? What if I came out, because what you're not seeing is the two sides of the truck that were absolutely horrid. The decals were peeling up. They had all these loose edges that peel up. If you've ever seen uh, decayed decals, you know exactly what I mean. I said, what if we do this? What if I come out and I shave that all off I do my best to sand it, feather in the edges, essentially make as smooth of a surface as possible, knowing that it will not be perfect. Then you get your sign shop who makes an overlay decal, not a die cut de de decal with individual letters or numbers, but a complete, it's essentially like a vinyl wrap. A big sheet of vinyl paper that has adhesive on the back that's been printed in what's called a four color process, full color. So you make a decal that covers the old decal and you're done. And you're now out of the equation with about a third of the cost if we had gone down the route according to your way. I said, what if we did that? Because think about it, the truck is old, you don't know how much longer it's gonna be on the road, I promise you customers or the, the world will not look at that and say, oh my gosh, that co company, look at, they did not prepare the surface properly. I can see the little nuances underneath the decal that are showing through now because they didn't remove it. Or they'll say, wow, that sign shop, no one's ever gonna do that. You know the only guys that are gonna do that are probably guys in the sign industry. And they'll look at that because like yourself, if you're a detailer, you are driving around out in the world and you are critiquing every car you see. And you think, oh, I know what I could do with that car. I know what I could do with that car. I would love to do that to that car because it could look so much better. So the only people that are gonna do that is sign guys. The rest of the world, they're busy in their own head. They're busy trying to be on their cell phone and avoid Johnny Law from giving them a ticket or tuning in the radio or whatever, whatever, whatever. Trust me, they are not overthinking it. So I'm telling this to her. I said, so what we are accomplishing is that we are getting the results that you want for essentially a third of the cost that it would normally take if we were to go with your plan. You're still gonna get the end result. It just won't be as perfect but it's what's called an ROI, or a cost-benefit analysis. So if we took her plan, plan A, it's like, okay, Mary, 
this is your plan and it's going to cost this much and the return on investment is going to be this much because the truck is old it's it's so nondescript anyways are you really having your truck labeled to get people to get on the phone because they see your truck driving by is it really part of your branding for this company do you even need to do branding because of this company and I'm not going to tell you what company it is so suddenly she's starting to connect dots differently and she's coming to a different conclusion and that is where building value comes in because now what I did is I became a solution provider I provided her with an alternate solution that still achieved to 99% the results that she wanted when, I, when we're all done with this, by the way, she's actually gonna say that it will be 100%. That I can assure you. But in the moment, she's looking at it like, okay, let's say I get it to 95%. We don't need perfection, Darren. What I really need is just to get it done. I need to fulfill the demands of my superior that told me to take care of this, and I just gotta get it done in a cost-effective way. So I became a solution provider for her. Most detailers, in my experience anyways, and I think I can speak from experience because I have dealt with many, many detailers and continue to do so this day. They would simply follow her lead and say, oh yeah, okay, I could charge you 2,500 bucks. And then they would lose the job. And then she would eventually find some detailer with uh, very little experience that did not know what he was signing on to to take the job on and probably mess the truck up and actually do damage because he became so frustrated he didn't know what he was doing and he didn't know how to price it out properly and he certainly didn't know how to communicate and he certainly didn't know how to build value and to come up with an alternate plan that actually made more sense. So that's where you can be different in your world with your customers is be a solution provider. Pull back, take charge of the conversation in a good way. But before you can take charge of the conversation, you've got to look at the bigger picture. And that's where you have to ask questions so you can understand the bigger picture. Okay, what does this person really want? They Calling up looking for a detail, is that really what they want, is a detail? What does a detail even mean to them? So when you can start asking those questions, because what they will be, all those little bits of information will be like dots. It's kind of like looking at the sky at night. Endless stars. Now you can connect those dots in endless ways and, and, and create whatever picture you want. So each one of those dots is bits of information for you. Now you as an expert or you as someone with more experience likely than your customer who's very ignorant, you can now take those dots and you can now form them into like a connect the dot for you, those of you that are young will have probably have no idea what that even means. It, uh, back in when I was growing up, we had these books that are called Connect the Dots. And so you would start and you would connect the dots and it was fun if you're like three years old because it forms a picture out of a, a, just a, a page with a bunch of black dots on it. And you think, oh wow, what's that? Well, if you just start at point A or number one and then you follow the proper order, and you connect them, suddenly a picture forms. So that's what you want to do, is you want to pull out that information, you see what the dots are, and then you start to create a picture for your customer that fulfills their needs, fulfills their wants, their objective. And that's how you become a solution provider. And that's how you build value into it, because you're not just a yes man, or you're not just a, yeah, this is what we charge. This is what we do. It's like, okay, I can get that anywhere. You wanna be different. Why do you wanna be different? Because if you can separate yourself from the other competitors or the masses, guys that don't know how to communicate, don't know how to build value, then guess what? You will be busier and not only busier, because to me, it's not about being busier. I don't want all of the business in the world. I want the right kind of business and ultimately I want to be as profitable as possible. So I could have lost this job very easily by just shocking her, which I did with this massive number. 
and she's like, oh my gosh. But I said, what we could do is go with my plan and you will get what you want and you'll get it for so much less than what you originally thought. But I have enough profit built into it that I'm willing to take on a project like this that is, just, I mean, this is messy, dirty ass work. Nobody in their right mind wants to do this, but I do. And I didn't know exactly what I was getting, getting, what I was getting myself into. Yes, I have plenty of experience doing this type of stuff, but every project ultimately is different. And it's worthy of a separate video, which is problem solving. Because this, I had to literally try five different tools, uh, four different chemicals, um, four different scrapers, made of plastic, metal, razor, I mean, I was trying all types of stuff. I used sandpaper and every, because the side is metal, aluminum panels, this is a wood roll-up door. It re represent a lot of challenges. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna make some like seriously good money. Like, like hit it out of the park kind of money. And everyone's gonna win. My customer wins because she's not gonna overpay to some detailer that probably has less experience. She's still gonna get the end result that she wants. She's gonna make her boss happy because now she's gonna come in under budget. The sign shop's gonna get their business still because I actually coordinated with him to make sure everyone was on the same page, which is that other video. So everyone wins. And at the end, I win also because I had the capacity or the ability to communicate, to assess, to get the her to answer the questions that I needed so that I could formulate an alternate plan and provide a solution that was better. And the return on investment or the cost benefit analysis was so much better with my plan than her plan. So I look like a superstar to her when it's all said and done because she's gonna be able to go back to her boss now and say, hey, hey, Mr. Boss Man, guess what I did? Uh, I got the project done and we came in under budget and it came out great. So there's my lesson in 100,000 words or less. I'm back at home now and I just want to show you guys all the tools that I had to use in doing this job. So I've got my Grios, kind of old school DA. I bought some uh, hook and loop sandpaper. Let me show you. And it was 80 grit, which seems like crazy aggressive. So that's 80 grit. These are sanding discs. So it's got the Velcro backing. I just slap it on my DA. That's how I sanded down the one side um, that I wasn't able to show you because I didn't want to show the uh, company name. I have also got my, let's see, what is this? This tool, it's pneumatic, which means it runs on air. There's my DeWalt compressor that I had in my van. What is this tool? Wait for it. Wait for it. The Auto Braid Dyna by Dynablade, I think it's called. I can't quite read it. Um, and this little attachment that goes to a rotary polisher, just screws on like a backing plate, is also a way for decal removal. So essentially, this is the same type of material. And you know how many of you, or you guys, you know how much I love my 3M, which I'm getting out right now. This is actually my debadging kit. I like everything compartmentalized. Kind of like life. I like to compartmentalize things. It's a coping mechanism. And if you're in front of a shrink, some shrinks would tell you that that's not good. But to me, I'm all for it when it's used properly. In this case, properly or appropriately means that it's about organization and efficiency. So I have all my tools here for debadging from fishing line, tape, um, whatever I need, scissors, polishing compound. Literally, I could just take this and go debadge a truck or car. But the same 
tools and same processes also is for decal removal. So I literally used my heat gun. I used the drill motor with the 3M eraser tool. Now to me, I've had guys, when I first bought this, I put it on a post and they're like, oh yeah, I love that tool. It's like, well, I love the tool also. The problem is, is that it eats a crap load of air. So if you don't have a big compressor, and even my compressor, a 15 gallon, does not keep up with this tool because it just goes through so much air. Now I can finesse it and get it to work by just taking a little break and then, you know, kind of switching between taking off the first layer with this, maybe taking off the adhesive with the rapid remover, whatever. So this is very fast, but it leaves such a, a big mess behind. The eraser, the 3M eraser tool, literally erases like up to 95% of everything. The top layer of the decal plus the adhesive. So to me, it's the eraser tool. So even between this, which is the same material as this, you just, this is where you have an arsenal because you just don't know what you're gonna roll into sometimes. Now a lot of you, and let me just address this, this is my Griot's Garage, it's a five inch backing plate pneumatic DA. And it's very cool and it was very effective because I could also put this sanding paper on that even though there's plenty of overhang for the application or purposes I was using it for, it was totally fine. So I used all these tools. There's my rapid remover. I had to use that. There's my acetone. I had to use that. And there's a whole discussion there because I've had guys tell me, it's like, oh, rapid remover is so expensive. I, I, don't, I can't justify the price. I'm just gonna use acetone. It's like, well, I could argue that. I could shoot holes in that argument all day long, which is why I continue to pay like $55 a gallon for rapid remover. It saves me a lot of stinking time if you know how to use it properly. So here's my arsenal that I had to use to do this job. I know many of you would, or are gonna be sitting out there saying, WTF, Darren, there's no way I would take that on. Well, if I can promise you probably 95% of you, let's say you bid it out at a price that you thought was acceptable and then you started to do the job, I guarantee 95% of you would have tapped out because it was horrid. Don't get me wrong. It sucked. It sucked ass. How about that? I mean, it's one of those messy ass jobs. And if you are a detailer you've and you have enough experience underneath your belt, you will have these jobs that is so dirty and you get so messy where you literally have to like dispose your clothes because it's just that horrid. Your shoes get trashed. Uh, it's just it's just messy. It's just messy, stinking work. Now I've had worse and I'm not gonna have to trash my shoes or my pants or my clothes or anything, but I've got disposable gloves. So it was just horrid, but I've had a lot worse. What I'm getting at is that most of you would lose the patience and you'd be like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? This is a monster and I'm gonna lose and I'm just gonna have to walk away with a loss and just tell the customer, have this awkward conversation and say, I can't do it. But that's where, that's just me. I just love a challenge because I know I'm gonna learn something every single time and this time I learned, and it's just cool because you've got this challenge in front of you and there's no direct path there's no path written out for you that says okay step one you do this step two you do this and then step three four five and six and then success it doesn't work that way you have some foundational guidelines or rules that you can go with but every step of the way you're like oh wait this isn't responding how it did last time or that last job I've got to figure out a better way so that I can get from point A to point B quicker and hopefully easier and by producing either the same results or better results. That's always what I'm thinking and I'm always strategizing. So I was able to do that. So instead of walking away making a hundred bucks an hour, which I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but in my world, I'm okay with that. A hundred bucks an hour and that includes 
everything. I'm talking traveling time. I'm talking on the phone time. I'm talking every single minute that I clocked in to getting this job done from the very first phone call to the very last step of invoicing the customer and even including taking the check to the bank and depositing it because time is money. I have reduced it down to that where I'm going to account for every single minute of my time because every minute that I spend doing something is a minute that I will never get back in life. So I'm gonna make sure that I am holding myself and the world accountable for every minute of my life. That may be extreme to you, but unless you start thinking that way, you will not be as profitable as you could be or want to be. So a lot of guys would walk away from this. A lot of guys would not even have attempted it, but okay, yes, it requires a certain level of experience. But once again, this is where the ability to problem solve for your customer, come to an alternate strategy. So I did that, I walked away, it's done. I wanted to show you everything that this entailed. Now, this is not for the beginner, I get that, but I'm just trying to drive home the principles and take it from my real world that, yeah, this is actually what I do. And it's pretty horrid sometimes, I'm not gonna lie. But when I realize how much money I'm making, so at the end of the day, by the time I'm, because what I have to do now, everything's done, is simply invoice the customer, take the check to the bank when I get it, and I'm accounting for uh, basically 20 minutes. I was gonna say 18 minutes, but then you guys would be like, okay, that's absurd. How do you know it's gonna take 18 minutes? Well, trust me, I know, because I know how long it's gonna take me to log onto my computer, print out an invoice, put it in the mail, in the slow mail, and then there's that time, I get the check back, go down the list. I know, it's called experience. So instead of making 100 bucks an hour, because I was able to strategize and cut to the chase, now I'm gonna walk away making $187 an hour. So when you factor in the kind of messiness of this and the fact that I had to kind of reconfigure my van, which once again, I accounted for that time, it's all factored in there. And you'd say like, that's too much work, Darren. It's like, okay, fine, go out. Tell me how you're gonna make 187 bucks an hour. Seriously, tell me. I mean, this will be posted on YouTube. If, if, if you're pulling in that kind of money, all I can say is thumbs up. Because in my world, even in California, where it's like everything's overpriced, I'm good with that kind of money. So feel free to make your comments. I'm just telling you, it's, it's not easy. And 30 years into this, it's still not easy. But what's cool is problem solving, uh, learning how to communicate with customers, learning how to deliver value, learning how to deliver value in a way that puts additional money into my pocket. Not only additional money, but a higher profit margin, because that's really what I'm after, is a, an increasingly higher profit margin. So that's just a little uh, moment into my real world.